the, mo the first most basic structure in programming is the sequence structure. Sequence comes from the word sequential. And literally, you're just doing one thing after another. And in pseudocode, you would start, you'd do something, you'd do something, you'd do something, then you would end or return. And the difference between ending, ending is the program's over, you're done, versus returning, if you're in a module where we've modularized, you return to the previous program that called it, and you may or may not send a value back. So either end or return. In a flow chart, it's a start, and this is your process routine, process, 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 and return. This is an annotation. This is how you do a comment in a flow chart, return for a module, end for a program. You always start and end with a lozenge, lozenge shape, and if it was a program, you would use the program name here. If it's a module, you would actually use the module name here instead of just a start. But when I'm using it generically, that makes sense. So that is the sequence structure, and it is the most basic structure in programming. The second structure for programming is the decision or selection structure. And I'll use these two words interchangeably. They mean the same thing. When you're actually talking in programming code, they're usually referred to as an if-then statement. And the way that you draw it, there's two options here. But this is your decision symbol. And you're going to check to see if some value is true or not. So you're going to check a value. And if it's true, one thing happens. And if it's false, something else happens. And this can have a bunch of different things happening. Or it can have nothing at all happening. But what's always true is it will always return to the same spot in the logic to go to the next level when it's done. So that is your decision structure. Now there are two common ways of drawing this. You can draw it with two branches. Or you can draw it going directly down, especially if nothing's happened, this is happening. It's very common to just draw a straight line where it branches off to the side if something happens. So that's an example. If we were going to do this with pseudocode, you'd have your start, and then you'd have an if statement, and then then. And this is what happens when true. And if there's something else, if there's alternate, because you could have something happening if it's false, you'd have an else for false. This one you might not necessarily use, because sometimes you only do something if something's happening. Good example, when you're going through your own personal logic, getting ready for the day, if it's raining, you'll take your umbrella. If it's not raining, you don't. So there's really not an alternate item to do. So that's what the basic structure for a decision or selection, again, they mean the same thing, that's your decision or selection structure. The final structure is looping. Looping is one of my favorite ones to teach. It's very, it saves you a lot of time. To be able to tell the program to do something over and over rather than typing the same line of code, it just makes life a lot easier for you as a programmer. The way that I normally teach this to my students is to teach them how to program 99 bottles of beer on a wall. Because looping doesn't make sense until it's going to save you some time. And even with copy and paste, typing out display, 99 bottles of beer on the wall, 99 bottles of beer, and then to change it and go to 98 bottles, 97 bottles, that really is a waste of time. It takes a lot of lines of code, and you can really, in most pro programming languages, code the entire 99 bottles of beer song in 10 lines or less, because you'll make it loop. So if you're thinking of that logic, you'd start, and you'd start with an initial value. This is usually considered if you were pulling it from a file, a priming read or a priming value, because we would initially start with 99, because that's the song, 99 bottles of beer on the wall. And we check because we're going to stop. Now we're counting down because we'd go from 99 to 98 to 97. 
So here we check, is 99 greater than 0? Yes. So we would display and we'd have it set up to 99 bottles of beer on the wall. The whole little stanza there. And then we would decrement. What I have here, it's value minus minus. What that means, that's shorthand in programming for the item value is going to equal itself minus 1. So instead of value being equal to 99, value will be equal to 98. And it's going to go through the loop again. Is it greater than 0? Yes. So it will keep looping. When it hits 0, you actually would probably have a final display of no more bottles of beer on the wall, and then you would end. But looping can save a lot of time. So those are your three structures. With those three structures combined in different ways, you can create any kind of program. Next, we're going to talk about combining them. When you're, when you're taking an unstructured program or you're solving your logic, you're often going to have to stack structures inside each other. So you can start with a decision structure, and inside of it, you can put a while structure. One of the things that people have the hardest time getting used to is the concept of modularization with this. Often, you're going to go through a series of steps. Let's say that we're making a bunch of kids lunch, and each kid wants something different because that's the way kids are. So we would have our start sequence over here, which would be called lunch. And the first thing we would do, now, since most homes aren't restaurants, usually they'll give your chi the child a choice. Do you want bologna or peanut butter and jelly? We'll just say that that's the only choice. And we will also say that we have to do this four times because they're four kids. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have a set number we're going to feed to feed equals four, because we have four kids to feed. So we know we have to do this four times. We're going to check to see if we start at four, we're going to count down to zero. And this is our priming input. Comes from priming the pump, where you have to put water in it first to make it pump. So to feed equals four. To feed greater than zero. If it's true, we would then, and here we can just call a module. And this is an interesting thing, because if we're calling a module, this is what's called a predefined process. Make sandwich. So we could call that. And this should actually, this is getting a little messy. I should have drawn this a little different. If it's true, we would make sandwich. I'm just going to do that as MS. And then we would come back and keep doing this until we were done with student with kids to feed. And then we were, when we were done, we would end. Now, we can modularize this by having this as a separate routine, or I could have written it in here, and I'll show you that in a minute. But if I were to break it out into a separate routine, then I would have a make sandwich routine, and then I would ask kind, and I would have PB for peanut butter, and I would go to I could further define this into the PB process. Or I could have a baloney. So these don't always have to be true and false. And that would have a predefined process for baloney. And when it was done, it would return. And that would return our logic to where we left. So it goes out here and returns here, comes back in, and we would keep going through until every child was fed. So you can actually modularize it by separating it into a separate module. Or we can simply make this a structured program, and it does not actually have to be a separate module. And this is such a small program that makes sense to do it in one place. So we could nest. So here, we would see if they were all fed to feed greater than 4. So if we have, if it's still great or greater than 0, 
if we have not fed them all, we would get type of sandwich. And I'm simplifying these to put it at a high level. And we might have a peanut butter one down here. And we'll simplify it. We won't go through all the steps. And typically in flow charting, you don't go through every step. You just say make a peanut butter sandwich. You don't say get out two slices of bread, put peanut butter on one side, put jelly on the other. You just make sandwich. Otherwise, it would be bologna. And you could make the bologna sandwich. And these could again return. And this gets sort of sloppy. It wouldn't return here. Once you've done it, it would go back here. So you've got to be a little bit more careful. It works better when you're doing this on a computer. It's much neater. But you'd keep going through these choices. You'd make the sandwich, and then you'd come back. And somewhere in here at this level, you would have to subtract to feed minus minus. Because if you forget this step, this is a critical step, it's an infinite loop. You'd never say all the kids are fed. So you'd have to keep making sandwiches endlessly. So you really want to keep going until there aren't any children left to feed. Then you drop out, and you're done. But you can nest loops inside each other. And you can take logic, instead of doing a go-to, you can make it fit into those structures. You can nest them as necessary inside each other or stack them to combine them in any way you need to. You can also break them out as separate modules or processes that you can call. And sometimes it makes it a little more sense if you break them into smaller pieces that you can program separately. And that's really the theory behind modularization.